Again, we're so thankful for those who are with us tonight, and please keep those who are absent from our assembly in your prayers. I'm just going to get into the lesson tonight, uh, as I want to say that if anybody have questions about what I preach, either here or anywhere else, feel free to contact me and we'll sit down and talk with you, because what we preach is is that we just want the Word of God, and if I'm not doing that, then I need to know that. And uh, I would appreciate all comments that could be made either for or against. But certainly want you to try to contact me. Uh, with, with This is going to be put on the web, and our address is there, and everything about what we do here. We're trying to make knowing the Word of God throughout our community and throughout anywhere this reaches, and I appreciate Belvis doing this. We've not said that before, but certainly he's doing a good job. If you've looked at that website, uh, he, he has done really good with that and setting it up the way that I think it's going to be beneficial for the church. So what I want us to do, I don't know if I turned that on or not, but to get started here is I want you to think about and I evidently have not. The question is, and what we should consider, in the most important questions of our life, and how would you view that? How would you look at it? What would be the most important in your life that someone could ask you? For example, is there a God? Hopefully it'll take you. Is there a God? Do you consider that question important? Do you think about that question as being an important question? I don't know why that don't pick up. And we should. It is a very important question. And we should think about that. There we go. All right, thank you. Sorry about this. Is there a God? Is the Bible really the Word of God? Now, when you view these questions, is there really a heaven and a hell? What must I do to be saved? Do you think that each of these questions is important in a person's life? I, I think they are very important but you know, these questions are really not the most important question. Now, you, you might be thinking, well, how would these not be? Well, I think the most important question that would have to be asked to an individual is the fact that are you honest? There is one question, and that is what it's about, about being honest, that makes these either be very good questions or just make them meaningless to us. That They don't mean a thing. Because if I'm not honest, these questions don't mean a thing to me. Now what is that question? It is the fact, am I an honest person? Am I really honest? When I face God's word, am I honest? Now, a lot of people will tell you they're honest. And they are a lot of honest people to a degree in this world. The thing is here is, why is this such an important question? Well, that's, that's what we want to look at. This is a question that must be answered in the heart of each ind individual or each person. Yet, it is a question that many avoid. People don't like the, this idea. What good does it do to have the right answer to the spiritual question if uh, question of life if the answer to the question is no? Does it do you any good to have the right answer? And you know, you understand that. How many people would ever admit they are not honest? Not very many people. I'm not going to stand up and tell you that they're a dishonest person. Most everyone would say yes, whether they mean it or not. To say no would be to tell others that I have no integrity as a person. 
So most people will tell you that they're honest. Most people would say it like this. I really try to be honest in all of my dealings. I strive to do that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But we want to look at some things here to consider. Some things to consider. We sometimes think if we can get a person to answer yes to the question about Bible truths, they will automatically do what's right. Do we believe that? If we can get people to sit down and they say, yeah, I can see that, that's what the Bible's saying, will that person automatically do right? And the fact about it is, is not all the time. The reality is that logical argument can lead one to say yes. Logic says nothing about the person's character and we understand why people say, I just don't see it like that. I just don't see it. I just can't see it that way. That's, that's their logic. They're not being honest. They're just not being honest. They don't see because the basic question of honesty has not been addressed. They say yes when evidence is overwhelming, but in their heart, they say no. That's the way a lot of people deal with the Word of God. I have a hard time understanding how that people can read through God's Word and yet discredit what God's Word teaches. But they do that. They do that by their teaching by what they believe. Before a person can address the question about spiritual things, they must first decide if they are going to be honest with the truth they find from God's Word. Now that's, that's the problem with people, is that when you pick up the Word of God, when you see the Word of God, are you going to be honest enough to deal with the truth of what God's Word teaches? And I can tell you right now, most people will not. Most people will reject it. And yet they claim to be honest all at the same time. I find that difficult. Again, let's look at the, the Word of God. Am I honest? Why is this po is important? Because it helps us answer the questions to the truth of God's Word. The Bible illustrates important, the importance of the, this question. The Bible itself does. The Bible itself shows that if honesty is not addressed, we're never going to come to the Word of God, to the truth of God's Word. I want you to think about what Luke 8, chapter 8, here verses 4 through 8, teach us. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city. He spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rocks, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it like moisture. And some fell among the thorns and sprang up with it and was choked, or uh, among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and it was choked. But others fell on good ground and sprung up and yielded a crop of a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears. To hear, let him hear. Now, think about that parable right there. Think about that parable. That parable tells us about the hearts of individual. Now, when the Bible speaks of the heart of an individual, it's not talking about the blood pump here. It's talking about the mindset of each one of these individuals. Here in this parable, you have the mindset of people. 
You have that inner man reaction to God's word. And this is what Jesus is talking about. Look at it. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So we automatically understand that this is the reaction that these people had against the word of God. Verse 12 here says, Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of the hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Here's an individual who hears God's word, but yet he allows Satan to remove it. He's not being honest with himself. But the one on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no roots, who believe for a while. And then time of temptation or tribulation or persecution, they fall away. They fall away. Now the one that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But those on the rock, or on that good ground rather, are those who have heard the word with a noble heart, or in other words, a honest heart. They're honest. They've received it in an honest heart. When they have found the truth, they hold to the truth. They stay the course with the truth, and they bring forth fruit. And they do that with patience because they understand that they're going to face trials and tribulations and be tempted, but they stay on course with God's word. But what about these others? Look at them. What was the difference here? What was the difference made? What was the difference between the good ground and those others? What was the difference? Was there difference in messages? Was, was that the difference? Was the message different to the other ones rather than to the one on the good ground? No, the message was the same. The message was the very same, but it had to do with the heart of that individual. So when you look at the heart of that individual, you can say that, in fact, that noble one had an honest heart. When he heard God's word, he was pleased to hear God's word. For a good example, think about those on the day of Pentecost and what the Bible says there. Those that gladly received his word were baptized. These were ones with noble hearts. These were the ones that with honest heart when they asked the question, men and brother, what must we do? And Peter tells them they accept that. And when one gladly accepts God's word, then one is going to act upon what God's word teaches them. That's what this good ground represents. It is that good heart that when he hears God's word, he accepts it with gladness. And they are obedient to it with gladness. Everybody hears the, hears the same message. The sower went out to sow this seed. Well, this seed was the word of God. Everybody heard the word of God. Everybody had the same opportunity with the word of God. Some received it, but yet they did not grow. They, they obeyed it, but they just did not have no depth. They did not have the will to go on. They weren't honest with themselves. Listen, Jesus talks about people obeying the gospel. He said, who's going to start a house unless he first sits down and count the cost? In other words, if we're going to obey Jesus we got to sit down and count the cost before we do that. And we got to look at that cost honestly with an honest heart. We've got to obey it from an honest heart. Think about that. Was the message different? No. The difference was the honesty or honest desire to serve God above all else. 
That was the good heart. That, that's the noble heart. That was the heart that, that really wanted to obey. That person was honest. That person was very honest. You know, we talked about Paul in our Bible study this morning. Paul was a man that said that he stood in good conscience with God. Everything that he did, he done it honestly. And when he come to recognize God's word, the New Testament, he was honest in that. He obeyed it. So you think about these people here. They, they show the heart. They show the set of the mind. How that they receive God's word. That's why it's so important for us to answer the question, do I have an honest heart when it comes to God's Word? Do I really have honesty in me enough that I want to serve God above all else? Do I have an honest heart in me to the point that I will turn away from everything that maybe I've been taught in life that is wrong and be willing to accept exactly what God has taught us in his word. That's what an honest heart will do. That's what Paul did. Look at this. The wayside refused to refused and rejected the seed or the word and was lost lest they should believe and be saved. They were lost. They didn't want nothing to do with it. They might have been honest in that way. They might have said, well, I'm honest in the fact that I won't obey it. But they're still not being honest. They're still being a hypocrite because they walk away thinking most time that they're all right. Look at it. The rock received with joy. Here was a person that just jumped aboard without really counting any kind of cost. Maybe it's like we think sometimes that once we become a Christian and like the, the world wants you to believe in the things that they teach and preach about God's word is that once you obey God's word that God is just going to shroud you with all the riches of this world and God is going to take care of you. Well, maybe this was the mindset of this person. Or maybe this person maybe just received it with joy here on the fact that he thought that this is what God was going to do for him. And yet when opposition comes and persecution comes, they're not willing to do that. You know, you got people that teach you that if you obey God, all your problems is, is it's over with. Everything is just fine right there. But that's not true. Now what is fine here when you obey God the adversary, the Satan, he's lost you as a servant. You're no more alienated from God. You, you've been reconciled with Jesus Christ. You can cry, Abba, Father. We're sons and daughters of the Father when we obey. Certainly that problem is solved, which is the problem we should be worried about. But listen, if you was in debt thousands of dollars when you obeyed, you know what? You're going to be in debt thousands of dollars after you've obeyed. You hear people say, well, you sow a seed of $1,000 and you get $10,000 back. and That's false teaching. That, that ain't nothing but, a, but lying. God didn't promise us that. God did promise us the things that we need. So you might have a person that receives it with joy thinking that, that the upside of this is that God is going to take care of him and he'll never have no problems in life. Jesus has promised us that he'll take care of us, that he'll give us the things that we need in life. But yet you got people who preach and teach the greed of life. And they believe that's God. That's not God. That's man. So maybe this is what this person was doing. Think about it. The thorns here. When you think about the thorns, receive the word, but again, would not go so far, but so far, because of the lust, was not willing to go all the way. The things of this world got the best of them. They began to look at this world. In other words, wait a minute. 
I obeyed the gospel and I still have problems in life. I still have to pay my bills. I'm still indebted. Yes, you are. God didn't say nothing about wiping out debts. He didn't say nothing about protecting you from, from the worldly elements of this world. Matter of fact, the Bible said all that will live godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution. He didn't say nothing about making us rich here on this earth. He didn't say nothing about making us live a lavish life here on this earth. But he has promised us that he's given us all things that pertain to life and that we can have a home in heaven. He has promised us that. And that he will do if we remain faithful. Well, this, this thorn person here, this person with this kind of heart in him, he would not stay the course. He would not go. I guess he found the way a little too difficult. Think about it. The honest heart. The reality is there are a lot of people who are as honest as the day is long. But that's up just to a point. That's just to a point. You talk about people, and you hear people talk about, oh, how they love God. Oh, how they love Jesus. And yet you present them with the word of Jesus. You present them with the word of God. And you find out that they're not lovers of God's word. They're just not lovers of it. You'll find out real quick how people turn off when you confront them with the word of God. So, when you're talking to someone and they start telling you how honest they really are with the word of God, oh, how they love Jesus, oh, how they love God, and you present them with the word of God and they refuse God's word, then their honesty automatically becomes an issue here. Their love for God becomes an issue here. Because Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. So if you don't love God enough to obey him, then everything that you say becomes a question. Do you really love God? Do you love God's word? Do you have that honest heart? You see, we can get ourselves in such a pickle when we start saying all these things without answering the word or the question about honesty. Honesty. Honestly. How do you feel about God and His Word? Oh, I love it. Oh, I love Jesus. We sing the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. You hear people talk about how they want to please God and how they want to please Jesus. But yet when it comes back to God's word, they refuse it, they reject it. And yet they say, oh, how I love God, oh, how I love Jesus. You see, can you see the question marks that that brings up? Some obey the Lord up, on the, up to a point of truth. Causing them difficulties. In other words, you believe the truth up to a point, and yet when that point begins to cause you difficulties, you want to turn away from it. Give you one perfect good example. You take people that's in a marriage, it's unscriptural. They love God right up to the point that you say, look, the Word of God teaches us that we can't live like that. Adulterers, and all thieves and fornicators are going to have their part in the lake of fire. They don't like that. They don't like that. You see, they'll believe the truth right up to that point, but they don't, they don't like it. Some people will believe the truth up to the fact, just like we said this morning, when you start teaching the plan of salvation and the one body, the one true body, the one body that our Lord established, and that causes them trouble. That causes them difficulties. Because... Look, their heart is not right. They have no honesty here. And that's when truth begins to cause problems with people. 
Sometimes you teach people that the Bible teaches us that we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, as Hebrews 10, 25 teaches. And this causes people trouble because they don't want to assemble. They only want to come when they want to come. This causes people trouble. And therefore they won't believe that. They turn away from it. They believe the truth until it becomes to condemn a family member. And because of that, they turn away from it. Men have even known to change the truth of their preaching to please a family member. We've had people to leave the sound churches and go into the liberal churches because they have family there. They compromise. Their heart's not honest. Even friends and neighbors, we compromise the truth for the sake of peace or popularity with people. That's, that's sad. So you see how the question of, of that honest heart has to be answered when you're dealing with people. Some obey the Lord up to the point of truth Calling calls upon them to either stop or start. In other words, what we mean by that is, is they'll believe the truth, but yet when you go to them and say, look, you need to either stop that or you need to start this. Then people will say, well, now you're meddling. You're meddling in people's life where you have no business. Listen, we're members one of another. We're the body of Christ. We're to be our brother's keeper. We're to watch out of our brothers. When we see a brother stop doing something that he should be doing, we should go to him. We should try to talk to him. If we see a brother that's not doing something that he ought to be doing, then we should go to him and try to talk him into doing it. But yet, sometimes, it's the compromising the truth for the sake of doing what we want to do. That's the problem. You see what I'm saying? And I know you've experienced this in your life. You talk to people, oh, how they cherish the truth. The truth up to the point that they want to believe. And yet when it goes beyond that, they don't want it. You see, they're not being honest. Can you not see that the question of honesty calls for big demands or calls for the big demands upon us? We've got to answer that question. The Bible illustrates the importance of this question. He shows us without honesty it's going to be hard for us to find the truth. Now, the question comes right here, just how honest are you? Just how honest are we? You say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. Well, okay, that, that's good. You say, I've obeyed the gospel. Well, that's, that's good. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of dishonesty among Christians. Because you got Christians that teach you that you don't take the Lord's Supper except in the mornings or when they're here. They believe it's only served one time in a day. And if you don't take it when they take it, you're not allowed to take it of a night. You see, that's their rule. That's their law. Because we got scriptures that says that the disciple came together upon the first day of the week to break bread. You don't set a time whether it was morning or evening. And it didn't say, Billy, if they're not there when you're there, they don't get the Lord's Supper. The Bible don't say that. The Bible does teach every individual to examine themselves and so let them drink, eat and so let them drink. That's what Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says for each Christian to lay by and store upon the first day of the week. That's what he says. And it's not for me to try to, try to fix those rules. As long as it's being taken up on the first day of the week, that's what it's... 
But I can say this. If you're just laying back at home Sunday morning because you're too lazy to get up out of the bed and you think, well, I'll go Sunday evening, you better examine yourself. But you got people that do that. Now, I want you to think about it. Just how honesty are you? Honest are you? John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. Look what Jesus says here. And this is the uh, condemnation that light has come into the world and, uh, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who doeth the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may have been done in God. In other words, here's a person with an honest heart. He comes to the light of God's word. What does he come to the light of God's word? That God's word is going to teach him that he is a sinner. That he needs redemption. And the word of God is going to teach him where redemption's at. It's in Christ Jesus. And the word of God is going to teach him what he needs to do in order to be a child of God. He'll come to that light that his deeds may need, uh, that they'll be known. Listen, we're all sinners. And we all need to come to the light of God's word. Again, look at James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and uh, overflowing of weakness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. That thing's flashing apparently. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he, he is like a man uh, observing himself or his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forget what kind of man he was. Here the Bible is saying this, look. Be honest with yourself. We, we've got to learn to be honest with ourselves. When we go to the mirror of God's word here, and that's what it's talking about. When we go to the mirror of God's word and we see the things that we're doing that's not right, or we see the things that needs to be fixed in our lives, we should not walk away from God's word and forget about those things that we see that needs to be worked on. We need to be honest with ourselves that we're not above sin and that the devil is our adversary and sometimes we're overtaken in faults and we need to fix those. We're not perfect. We need to fix them. But look at verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word or the work, this will be blessed, or this one will be blessed in what he does. How's he going to be blessed? Is when he looks into that word. When he looks at himself, and he don't forget what he looks like, and he don't forget to fix what's wrong, then this man is going to be blessed. This is a man with an honest heart. This is the individual that's got an honest heart can stand and look in God's word and say, I understand I'm not perfect. I understand that I'm going to be caught in sins. I understand that Satan's going to try to trip me up. And I understand that he is a worthy adversary and that I can't defeat him on my own. But I have an advocate with the Father. I have a mediator. I have one that I can go to that will help me to defeat him. But I've got to have an honest heart in doing that. I've got to look at the word of God and be honest about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Examine yourself whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourself that Jesus is in you 
unless indeed you are disqualified, the King James says reprobate, which means the same, that you're disqualified. We need to make an examination of us, and that's exactly what James is saying. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. See what manner of person you really are. And from that, make, make the right things. If I need to come to the light, then come to the light to make those deeds known. That's, that's what I need to do. Again, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, I've got to be honest, and I've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Again, the word of God will bear fruits only in an honest heart. That's the only place it's going to bear fruit. It can't bear fruit from other trees. That's what Jesus said that every evil tree, my father's going to cut down. Why? Because the evil tree can't bear fruit. It can't bear fruit to God. It's just, it's, it's unable to do that. No good fruit can come from a bad tree. Jesus is saying no good fruit comes from false teaching. No good fruit can come from a dishonest heart. That's exactly what he's saying. Deciding to have, to deciding, if I'm saying my word right, or to have an honest heart is the starting point in our quest for truth. That's, that's, that's your starting point for, for to know God's truth is to say, you know, look, no matter what, what it is, no matter how, it's, how it seems, the only thing I'm going to look to is God's word and I'm just going to dig for the truth of the matter. You know, Jesus said, knock and it shall be open. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given. We've got to seek for the truth. We've got to knock on the Bible. We've got to knock on people's noggins and find out what they believe and stuff like that. Going by the, what God's Word teaches us. When we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we can be filled. But we have to do that with an honest heart. If you're not honest, the truth will be, always be elusive. You'll just never be able to, to, to lay hold on it. But if you are honest, the truth of God will always be found. We can always find it. God won't hide it from an honest heart. Then we come back to the facts of the question. Is there a God? An honest heart is without doubt going to believe that. No doubt with the honest heart, one is going to defend that. He's going to contend for that faith. He's not going to be moved away from that. He's going to stand there. He's going to believe that God is the creator of this earth, the creator of man, that he is the God of heaven, that he is the God that's going to reward those who diligently seek after him. They're going to believe that, and they're going to defend that. Is the Bible really the word of God? Paul said to a young man, Timothy, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and I believe that. I'm going to defend that because it's there. Because God is capable and able to keep his word in man's hand that man may be saved. John says that we may know the truth and the truth will make us free. Without God's word, we have no truth. Jesus in his prayer in John 17 says, Sanctify them through the truth. Thy word is truth. If the Bible is not God's word, then we have no truth. And if we have no truth, we can't be sanctified. If we have no truth, we cannot know it. So I believe that God's word is true. And nobody's going to convince me any different. Is there a heaven and hell? If there's really a God, there's really a heaven and hell. God has given us his word to teach us of these two places. 
Jesus said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's two roads to travel, two kingdoms to be in, and two places or destinations to end up. I believe in the heaven. If uh, Corinth, not Corinthians, but Colossians says in chapter 3, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. That's in the heavens. I believe that. I believe that there is a heaven and it's just as Revelation says that all liars have their part in the lake of fire. I believe that there's a hell. There's a hell to be dodged and there's a heaven to be gained. I believe that, do you? What must I do to be saved? Do you believe that you need to be saved? I believe I need to be saved. Who is able to save me? Well, Peter said in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven, whereby man must be saved. That name he's talking about is Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says that Murray would bring in a son, and that son would save his people. Jesus died for all the sins of the world, that through his death that we could have eternal life. But Jesus has also put those stipulations to what we must do in order to gain that life. And those were to hear God's word and hearing God's word that it would produce a belief or a faith in us. And that faith in God's word would bring us to a repentance in life. And that repentance would bring us to a confession of him as being the Lord and Savior. And that confession of him being confessed before men would bring us to believe and to know and understand that we all must be baptized for the remission of sin. Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Romans chapter 6 teaches it. It is throughout the whole Bible that that is taught. So we need to understand this is what God would have you to do. Now I'm going to ask you, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to walk up and say, I have an honest heart, I believe this, and I want to obey this? Because that's what it's going to take, an honest heart. A very honest heart to do it. That you truly believe. How do you answer these questions? How would you answer it? How do you feel about it? You say, well, I, I've done that. Well, all right, what about when God's Word teaches you to what you need to do, what you need not to do? Do you hearken to that, or do you continue on? Think about that. If you're here as a person that has never obeyed the gospel, that's the thing that we just laid out there for you to do. If you're an child of God, then the thing that you need to do is repent of that and come forward and let those of a spiritual mind pray with you and for you, and we stand ready to help you in any way as together we stand and sing.